Hello. In this third section of my lecture on mental testing in the United States, I want to discuss briefly the work of Lewis Terman and Robert Yerkes. Lewis Terman was the professor of psychology at Stanford, where he made his department into a leading graduate and research center. He became best known for devising an amended version of Binet's intelligence scale, which thus became known as the Stanford Binet scale. Terman was the twelfth of fourteen children in an Indiana farm family and the first member of his family ever to go to college. Despite poverty, he was able to succeed by hard work, gaining a fellowship at Clark University and a registered doctorate in 1905. Perhaps surprisingly, given his background of poverty and his own life achievements, he firmly accepted hereditarian views. Seeing flaws in Goddard's translation of the Bine Simon scale, Terman undertook a major revision. Under Terman, the Stanford Binet scale was extensively tested and correlated with teachers' reports for a very large number of children of all ability levels, and the scales at the top levels were expanded. First published in 1916, the Stanford Binet scale became the standard measure of intelligence in the United States until replaced by its 1937 revision. In turn, this revision became the model for all later IQ tests. Like the original Binet Simon scale, it saw intelligence in terms of mental abilities and tested such qualities as memory, language comprehension, size of vocabulary, eye hand coordination, knowledge of familiar things, judgment, likeness and differences, arithmetical reasoning, ability to detect absurdities, and the speed and richness of association of ideas. Terman originated the convention that a child or adult scoring 90 to 110 in these tests was average or normal, and that one scoring 130 or more was more or less a genius, while one scoring less than 70 was feeble-minded. Statistically, those scoring between 70 and 129 comprised 99% of the population, so those at the two extremes, 130 or more, or less than 70, were genuinely exceptional. Terman's vision was that by identifying the feeble-minded, these tests would mean that people would no longer blame the mentally defective workmen for industrial inefficiency, or punish feeble children because of their inability to learn, or imprison or hang mentally defective criminals who lack the intelligence to appreciate ordinary codes of social conduct. At the same time, he thought, it would be possible to bring tens of thousands of high-grade defectives under the surveillance and protection of society, and thus curtail the reproduction of feeble-mindedness, and so eliminate an enormous amount of crime, pauperism, and industrial inefficiency. Turning now to the work of Robert Yerkes, we see the introduction of mass testing. This was a revolutionary development. All the tests derived from the Binet Simon and Stanford Binet models were, and continue to be given by a psychologist or trained technician, to one person at a time. They are therefore time consuming and expensive to administer. Yerkes tests, by contrast, were designed to be administered to a large number of people all at once by test administrators who were not necessarily trained in psychology. The Yerkes tests were a response to the American decision to enter the conflict of World War I in 1917. In this context, the American Psychological Association appointed a committee to consider what contribution psychology could make to the war effort. The committee decided that the best contribution would be the development of effective mental tests, which could be quickly given to a large number of military personnel, so as to both eliminate the mentally incompetent, classify individuals according to their abilities, and select the most competent for special training and responsible positions. To accomplish this goal, a group of psychologists, including Terman, Goddard, and Robert Yerkes, a Harvard professor, met at Vineland and began preparing the tests. Yerkes was commissioned into the army in August 1917 as a major and ordered to carry out the plan. He assembled a staff of 40 psychologists who, in two months, produced the Army Alpha, a written test, and the Army Beta, a pictorial test, for the 40% of inductees who were functionally illiterate, 
and to whom an assistant would read out the instructions. To modern readers, the alpha questions seem sometimes a strange mixture of folk wisdom, scientific information, and morality. Examples include, one, if plants are dying for lack of rain, you should a. water them, b. ask a florist advice, or c. put fertilizer around them, or again, it is better to fight than to run because a. cowards are shot, b. it is more honorable, or c. if you run you may get shot in the back. Yerk's team began to give the test in four camps, but within weeks the Surgeon General decided that the program should be extended to the entire army. The work of the army psychologists was resisted by professional officers, but the impact was massive. By the end of the war in November 1918, over 1.7 million men had taken the tests, and some 300 psychologists under Yerkes had graded each man and suggested a suitable military assignment for him. The tests had led to about 8,000 men being discharged from the army as unfit, the assignment of another 10,000 of low intelligence to non-competent activities such as labor battalions, and in part the selection of two-thirds of the 200,000 men commissioned newly as officers during the war. In retrospect, we can say that the army testing program had far greater impact outside of the military than within it. Americans became far more conscious of the practical applications of psychology. Cattell said that the war had put psychology on the map. The Alpha test led to the explosive expansion of intelligence testing, so that it soon became a multi-million dollar industry. Testing also became prevalent in schools and colleges, the military, and various segments of business and industry. Particular post-war tests included a paper and pencil test put together by Terman, Yerkes and others under the auspices of the National Research Council in 1923 that was widely used in schools, and the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT, a version of which is still widely used. Other scales were developed during the 1920s and 1930s to measure a range of other abilities, including musical, mechanical, spatial, verbal and mathematical skills. More pervasively, by the 1930s, American schools had commonly introduced systems of tracking, whereby children were classified into tracks at an early age, and so assigned to either pre-university or vocational school programs. A similar system was introduced in Britain, where it was referred to as streaming. Even though intelligence testing had already come under attack as early as the 1920s, Binet's approach to mental testing had opened up a vast area of psychological research, and the Army Alpha approach had made testing into an easy and relatively inexpensive procedure comparable to an assembly line. For further details on these topics, please see the section in our textbook, Morton Hunt's The Story of Psychology. Thank you.